Sometimes murder investigations lead nowhere. The reasons are many. Firstly, a lack of leads, of clues that could tell the police something about who might possibly have committed the crime. Secondly, incompetence. Leads that are not followed up, clues that are missed. Thirdly and perhaps most disturbing of all, a lack of will. A fear of turning up evidence that could compromise those in high places. In the case of Martha Moxley, a girl of 15 who was brutally beaten to death in 1975, all these factors may have come into play. Whatever the truth of the matter, a few years after Martha's murder the case went completely cold. But over two decades later, the publication of a best-selling novel based on the murder reignited interest in the case. As a result, in 2002, 27 years after Martha Moxley's brutal murder, the culprit was brought to trial and convicted. But before continuing we welcome you to our channel The Murder Files where we discuss the most breathtaking, terrifying and strange true crime stories and also we would like to send our sympathies to loved ones and families who fell victim to the obnoxious crimes presented on this channel. Martha Moxley was born in 1960 in San Francisco, California. Her family were prosperous, middle-class people who were able to offer their daughter all the privileges of a stable, well-to-do family life. In 1974, the family moved to the neighborhood of Bell Haven, a gated community in Greenwich, Connecticut. With its big houses and immaculately kept lawns, Bell Haven seemed the perfect place to raise a family. It was, above all, safe. But, as it turned out, the move was a fateful one. Greenwich proved to be anything but safe for Martha. A year after the family moved to Bell Haven, Martha Moxley was dead. On the night of the 30th of October 1975, Martha set out with her friends to have some fun. The night before Halloween was known in the area as Mischief Night, when youngsters would amuse themselves by throwing eggs, spraying shaving cream, and trailing toilet paper around. These pranks were sometimes a nuisance, but usually harmless enough. However, that evening Martha and her girlfriends stopped at the house of the Skakel family to see their friends, brothers Tommy and Michael. The Skakels were well known in the area. They were related to the Kennedy family through Ethel Kennedy, the wife of Robert F. Kennedy and were extremely wealthy. However, despite their social connections and money, there were serious problems in the family. The boy's mother, Anne Skakel, had died of cancer two years earlier, leaving her husband Rushton in charge of the household. After his wife's death, Rushton had taken to drinking excessively, and their teenage children had been allowed to run riot. They were a constant source of worry to the neighbors, and behaved in a rude, unruly, and undisciplined way. However, because of their class position, the bad behavior of the young Skakels was largely tolerated, with dire consequences, as it turned out. Martha's mother became worried when her daughter did not return that night. She phoned Martha's father, who was out of town, as well as her neighbors and friends. Finally, she phoned the police, who although they drove around the area looking for her daughter, were unable to locate Martha. Former Greenwich Police Detective Stephen Carroll got the call. We knew it was a girl because her jeans and her panties had been pulled down below her knees. And uh, the head, her hair, was just red with blood, soaked with blood. In the morning, the terrible truth was revealed. Martha's body was found under a tree not far from her house, beaten to death with a six-iron golf club. During the assault, the shaft had broken, and a piece of it had been used to stab her through the neck. Her jeans and underclothes had been pulled down, but she did not appear to have been sexually assaulted. When police took the golf club for analysis, they found that it was an expensive one, part of a set used by Ann Skakel. There was other evidence that pointed to the Skakel boys. Martha's girlfriends reported seeing Tommy with Martha before they left for home that night. Looking for clues in Martha's diary, Martha's mother told police that her daughter had written about Tommy's sexual advances towards her, and how she had tried to repel them. 
Although the police searched the Skakel home, it was only a cursory visit. The police never issued a search warrant, which would have enabled them to do a proper search of the house without the owner's permission. Later, commentators criticized the police's conduct, claiming that Rushton Skakel's high-up connections and political influence had stopped them from going further. Carol now says they could have done more. I probably was intimidated by the, the, the wealth and the power and, and the money there uh, because we knew who they were. We knew the relationship between uh, the Skakels and the Kennedys. Instead, the police followed up leads on other suspects, such as a tutor living with the Skakel family, a neighbor who lived close by the Moxleys, and several drifters who had been near the area on the night of the murder. However, these clues led nowhere, and by the 1980s, the investigation into Martha Moxley's murder had come to a grinding halt. In Bell Haven, it became an unmentionable subject, perhaps because of the Skakel influence, or perhaps because the wealthy inhabitants of this seemingly peaceful, well-tended residential area could not bear to remember that they were not, as they thought, safe from danger. It's a wound for the whole community, and uh, it's a wound that I think Greenwich still suffers with today. Even when people weren't talking about this case, uh, it was a presence. People knew about it, and they did bring it up privately. It was not until another Kennedy, William Kennedy Smith, became the center of another drama that memories about Martha Moxley were jogged. In a high-profile case that attracted a great deal of media attention, Smith was accused of raping a woman in Palm Beach, Florida. He was acquitted, but rumors began to circulate that he knew something about the Moxley murder. Two years later, a novel by Dominic Dunn entitled A Season in Purgatory appeared, which was based on Martha's murder. The novel proved to be a bestseller. The author went on to meet Mark Furman, whose notorious role in the O.J. Simpson case received enormous publicity. Furman decided to look further into the Moxley case and, in 1998, published murder in Greenwich. In it, he named Michael Skakel as the prime suspect. However, all agreed that now, the case had to be given a boost, and accordingly, in May 1998, a request for a grand jury investigation was granted. Under this new initiative, over 50 witnesses were called in, some of them pupils and staff of a rehabilitation program Michael Skakel had taken part in at Elon School in Maine. He had apparently confessed to Martha's murder during that time. Other witnesses, such as the tutor in the Skakel household at the time of the murder, talked about Michael's disturbed behavior. He was reported, on one occasion, to have killed a squirrel when out golfing, and pinned it, crucifix-like, over a hole. By his own admission, he had been an alcoholic from his early teens, and had suffered abuse from his father. He had been devastated by his mother's death, and had felt that she was the only person holding together the dysfunctional Skakel family. As it emerged, from an early age both Michael and his older brother, Tommy, had been extremely disturbed, difficult children. In all, there were seven Skakel children, and there were numerous family problems throughout the drinking heavily in front of their younger brothers and sisters, and their tutor Kenneth Littleton. Martha and her friends had visited, and she and Tommy had begun to make amorous advances towards each other. What also transpired was that, after the murder, police initially investigated Tommy as a suspect. He took two lie detector tests, one of which he failed, and one of which he passed. However, after this, his father Rushton withdrew from the process, refusing to make Tommy available for further investigation. The fact that the police accepted this, and ceased their inquiry, had attracted criticism at the time. However, it later became clear that the police were following up the wrong suspect. It was Michael, not Tommy, who killed Martha, in a fit of jealousy because she appeared to prefer his older brother. The results of the grand jury investigation were made public on 19 January 2000. Skakel was arrested on a charge of murder, and brought to trial two years later, on 4 May 2002. The jury took four days to reach a verdict, but when they did they found him guilty. He was sentenced to a term of life imprisonment. After Michael Skakel was sent off to prison in August 2002, his cousin Robert Kennedy Jr. became his staunchest supporter. 
Kennedy insisted his cousin didn't have fair representation at his murder trial because his attorney Mickey Sherman failed to call a critical witness who would have confirmed Michael's alibi. In 2013, after spending 11 and a half years in prison, Michael Skakel got a huge break when a judge agreed that Skakel's representation had been inadequate and overturned his conviction, granting him a new trial. That decision was ultimately upheld by the Connecticut Supreme Court. In October 2020, Michael Skakel received another piece of good news when the Connecticut state's attorney announced they would not retry him, saying the state couldn't prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. And so, 46 years after her murder, Martha Moxley's case once again goes cold and her childhood friends have little hope that her killer will one day be brought to justice, unless somebody out there decides to reveal a secret they may have been keeping for all these years. We sincerely hope that you had liked our video. Please subscribe our channel and also click the like button for more of these video.